Uh, hi, this is Dr. Mridula. Uh, today, I'm from uh, Sri Lakshminarayana Institute of Medical Sciences, Pondicherry. Today, we are going to discuss about carcinoma tongue. Before uh, discussing about carcinoma tongue, we need to know about the anatomy of the oral cavity in the tongue. So we'll go and get into the anatomy of the oral cavity. So the oral cavity extends posteriorly from the lips to the junction of hard and soft palates superiorly. Anterior tonsillar pillars are the lateral boundaries of the oral cavity. There is a line of sulcus terminalis and circumvallate papillae of the tongue inferiorly. And the oral cavity is divided into the lip, oral tongue, floor of the mouth, buccal mucosa, lower gingivum, retromolar trigon, hard palate, and upper gingivum. So this is a picture which shows the anatomy of the oral cavity. You can see this is the oral cavity from the lips to the anterior tonsillar pillars. This is the tongue. This is a hard palate and this part is a soft palate. These are the lips and this is the gingiva, the gums. And this is a tongue. This is a, a lingual tonsil or a pharynx epiglottis. So this gives a better picture. This shows the upper lip, the gingiva, and this is a hard palate with the midline uh, palatine interface, soft palate, anterior tonsillar pillar, the palatine tonsil, the tongue, the uh, base of the, this is the uh, inferior surface of the tongue and floor of the mouth, uh, which shows the opening of submandibular gland. And these are the lower gingiva. This is a vestibule and inferior lip. Uh, coming to retromolar trigon, it is a very important uh, region in oral cancers. So it is defined as an anterior surface, the ascending ramus of mandible. So it is somewhere here, anterior surface of ascending ramus of mandible. It is usually triangle in shape. Uh, the base is upper or superior behind the third upper molar tooth and apex is inferior behind the third lower molar tooth. And uh, the mucosa is closely adherent to the ascending ramus of mandible. So this is a retromolar trigon roughly. So carcinoma in this region often invades ascending ramus of mandible and may spread upwards to involve the retro or terigo mandibular space. A lip split and mandibulotomy are needed to gain access to this region. There is a referred otalgia occurs from innovation by trigeminal nerve, lesser palatine nerve, and glossopharyngeal nerve. Lymphatic drainage is usually through level two lymph nodes. So see, this is a classical region of uh, or the retromolar region. It is behind, but the, this is a superior, uh, uh, this is a base of the trigon, this is the apex of the trigon. So the base of the trigon is behind the third molar, upper third molar. And coming to the anatomy of the tongue, the tongue is a muscular structure which is covered by non keratinized famous epithelium. Anterior two thirds of the tongue is called an oral tongue. The posterior one third of the tongue, which occupies the oral pharynx, is, uh, is called the tongue base or uh, lingual tonsil. There is a line of demarcation known as circular sulcus terminalis, which is a V shaped groove behind the circumvallic papillae. And the dorsum of the tongue is covered by filiform, fungiform, and circumvallic papillae. There is a foramen of cecum at the apex of the sulcus terminalis, which is the site of origin of the thyroid gland. And on the ventral surface, there is a frenulum lingulum. So this is a anatomical uh, anatomy of the tongue describing the circumvallate papillae, the palatine tonsils, the lingual tonsil, the folate papillae, filiform and fungiform papillae. Coming to the muscles of the tongue, the muscles of the tongue are divided into the intrinsic muscles and extrinsic muscles. Intrinsic muscles are superior longitudinal, inferior longitudinal, transverse, and vertical muscles. And extrinsic muscles are genioglossus, hyoglossus, styloglossus, 
in front of the process. So you can see the in intrinsic muscles, which are longitudinal. These are the transverse group of muscles, particular group of muscles. And the extrinsic muscles, they are the palatal process. Okay, one which is going from the palate to the tongue, genioglosis from the mandible to the tongue, hyoglosis from the hyo to the tongue, styloglosis from the styloglosis to the tongue. These are the extrinsic muscles of the tongue, and the others are parenchymal muscles. So there is a superior longitudinal muscle, so which lies just beneath the long mucosal membrane, and it shortens the tongue and makes the dorsum of the tongue concave. So this is a layer, superior longitudinal, this is an inferior longitudinal. The inferior longitudinal muscle, it lies close to the inferior surface of the tongue between genioglosis and hyoglosis, and it shortens the tongue and makes the dorsum of the tongue convex. So these are the muscles. The superior is to make the tongue concave, and this muscle, inferior longitudinal, is useful to make the uh, tongue convex. And there are the transverse muscles which extend from the median, median septum to the margins and makes the tongue narrow and elongated. So these are the transverse group of muscles. And then the vertical muscles, they are found at the borders of the anterior part of the tongue and makes the tongue broad and flattened. These are the vertical group of muscles which make the tongue broad and flat. And coming to the extrinsic muscles, the genioglosis, hyoglosis, styloglosis, and palatoglosis. So the genioglosis, it originates from the upper genital tubercle of mandible, hence the name the genio, genium. And it is inserted into the upper fiber. Upper fibers are inserted to the tip of the tongue, the middle fibers to the dorsum of the tongue, and the lower fibers to the hyoid bone. And they retract the tip and depress the tongue and pull the posterior part forwards. That is, they help in the protrusion of the tongue. So these are the genioglosis muscles. Okay, some part into the uh, into the tip of the tongue, some into the middle part, some into the hyoid bone, upper, middle, and lower fiber. Then hyoglosis muscle. It originates or uh, from the greater cornua and lateral body of hyoid, and it is inserted into the side of the tongue. It is helpful in depressing the trunk, retracting and protruding the tongue. So these are the hyoglossus muscles. And styloglossus, they arise from the tip and anterior part of the styloid process and they are inserted to the side of the tongue and they pull the tongue upwards and backwards during swallowing. Palatoglossus, uh, they are raised from the oral surface of palata and aponeurosis and they are inserted into the side of the tongue or the junction of oral and pharyngeal part of the tongue. So this muscle helps in pulling, the, pulling up the root of the tongue and approximates the palatoglossal arches. So this is a styloglossus muscle and this is a palatoglossus muscle. The same thing. So this is a genioglossus and uh, this is a styloglossus, stylohyoid, palatoglossus. This is a styloid process. This is a tongue with a frenula, which is the inferior extension of the tongue. And there's also the same extrinsic muscles which are shown. So this is one more view showing the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. So you can see this is a vertical and transverse group of muscles. These are superior longitudinal group. These are inferior longitudinal group. These all are paired muscle groups. These are the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. Then coming to this is a median septum. Extrinsic muscles are the genioglossus, hyoglossus, Styloglossus. Here is a styloglossus muscle. This palatoglossus, you uh, we cannot appreciate in this picture. So there is a midline fibrous septum which attaches to the hyoid bone posteriorly, and it is present through the entire tongue and does not reach the dorsum of the tongue. It provides an avascular plane. So this is a midline or median fibrous septum. Coming to the arterial supply of the tongue, 
there are pair lingual arteries which are branches from the external carotid artery they run above the greater horn of the hyoid bone deep to the hyoglossus muscle and they pass towards uh, the tip of the tongue and beneath the hyoglossus there are dorsal lingual branches uh, which go into the posterior part at the anterior border of hyoglossus a branch uh, to the sublingual gland and the floor of the mouth and continue as deep lingual artery so here is a this is a external carotid artery which is giving the lingual artery and which runs in relation to the hyoglossus muscle and gives the dorsal lingual arteries and here it gives branches to the sublingual gland and also to the tongue as a deep lingual artery it continues as a deep lingual artery the same picture and the same uh, picture where it's showing the lingual artery and uh, this is a deep lingual artery the branches to this this is a sublingual uh, branches and uh, these are the dorsal lingual arteries venous drainage venous drainage accompanies the lingual artery there are dorsal branches Uh, which are uh, which drain is the dorsal lingual vein, and from the tip they drain into the deep lingual vein, and this vein runs back superficial to the hyoglossus and joins the sublingual vein from the sublingual gland to form the vena comitans of hyp um, hypoglossal nerve. It continues backwards close to the nerve and joins either the lingual vein or facial vein or internal jugular vein. The lingual vein usually joins IJV near the greater bone of the greater horn of uh, hyoid bone so here you can see this is the lingual veins the dorsal lingual vein and the lingual vein this is uh, uh, these run along the lingual vessels lingual artery okay this is a this is a dorsal lingual vein and this is a uh, deep lingual vein in relation to the hyoglossus muscle they combine and they uh, this is a common carotid artery they combine and finally they drain into the internal jugular vein and nerve supply all the muscles of the tongue uh, are supplied by the hypo hypoglossal nerve except palatoglossus which is supplied by the pharyngeal plexus this is a motor supply coming to the sensory supply the anterior two thirds of the tongue is Uh, the general sensation is supplied by the lingual nerve, which is a branch of trigeminal nerve, and taste by cauda tympani nerve. Posterior one third of the tongue, glossopharyngeal uh, nerve, gives both general sensation and special sensory, that is taste. The posterior most part of the tongue is supplied by the vagus nerve to the internal laryngeal branches. Parasympathetic. Secretory motor fibers to the anterior lingual gland, superior salivary nucleus, is supplied uh, via the superior salivary nucleus, cauda tympani nerve, and rely on the submandibular ganglion. Okay, this is a picture which is showing uh, the specified nerve supply. You can see the anterior, uh, th anterior uh, two thirds and posterior one third. Here it is supplied by the lingual nerve and cauda tympani nerve. And the muscle supply is by hypoglossal nerve. Palatoglossus is supplied by vagus nerve or the pharyngeal plexus. And the special sensations on the posterior one third is by glossopharyngeal nerve, and uh, the pharyngeal part by internal pharyngeal nerve. So during surgery of the tongue, that is glossectomy, a preservation of at least one hypoglossal nerve is needed in order to maintain mobility and oral function. Uh, referred otalgia in cancer tongue is because of trigeminal nerve uh, stimulation, which uh, which also has a sensory branch to the external auditory canal and tympanic membrane and temporomandibular joint via the auricular temporal nerve. And glossopharyngeal nerve sense is sensory to the middle ear, and it is called Jacobson's nerve. So there is a re referred pain uh, in CA tongue. Patients because of these two nerves, that is the trigeminal nerve branches and glossopharyngeal nerve branches. 
So this is the hypoglossal nerve which supplies all the muscles of the tongue except palatoglossal muscle. And uh, you can see the protruded tongue is divided uh, is uh, deviated towards the side of the lesion due to the unopposed action of the genioglossus muscle. Okay, this is a genioglossus muscle which protrudes the tongue. Since the opposite side, the genioglossus is lost. Uh, because of high action of uh, the normal uh, normal nerve, the tongue, uh, the tip of the tongue is deviated towards the side of the lesion. So the genial glasses on the side of the lesion is uh, is paralyzed because of damage to the hypoglossal nerve, either by involvement due to involvement uh, by the growing tumor. Lymphatic supply of the tongue. So the tip of the tongue generally drains into the submandibular submental group of lymph nodes, which are level 1a. The lateral tongue into the submandibular nodes, which are level 1b, and uh, jugulodigastric nodes, that is level 2, and jugulohomohyoid nodes, which are level 3. The base of the tongue is supplied by jugulohomohyoid and jugulodigastric. Uh, the base of the tongue is drained into jugulohomohyoid and jugulodigastric nodes. And there is a communication of lymphatics across the midline, and there is a high instance of bilateral metastasis. So this is the lymphatic drainage. You can see the posterior part is going into the superior deep cervical nodes, and uh, there is a crisscrossing of uh, lymphatic supply. That is, there is no strict strict uh, uh, ipsilateral uh, lymphatic drainage. Lymphatic from either side will drain into both sides of the neck. Okay, so from the posterior uh, part, midline, posterior mid uh, part of the tongue to the inferior deep cervical nodes, and the lateral part to the submandibular tip to the subventral nodes. The same picture. So level uh, levels of nodes, uh, cervical nodes one, two, three. Uh, carry highest risk of metastasis from oral squamous cell cancer. Metastasis to level 4 and 5 are very rare. So uh, in order to know the metastasis to the neck, we need to discuss about the lymph nodes of the neck. So lymph nodes of the neck are divided into uh, seven groups. 1A is the submental nodes, 1B is submandibular, 2A and 2B are upper jugular, 3 is middle jugular, 4 is lower jugular, 5A and B are the uh, posterior triangle group, level 6 is anterior compartment group, and level 7 is superior mediastinal group. So this is the submandibular, mental submandibular, upper jugular, omohyoid, level 4 is uh, lower cervical, this is posterior triangle, anterior compartment, and 7 is superior mediastinal. So level one, they are bounded by the body of the mandible, anterior belly of uh, contralateral digastric, posterior belly of epistolated digastric, and stylohyoid muscle. This is the level of level one A nodes. So level one A is by anterior belly of digastric muscle and hyoid bone. Between the two diagnostic muscles and the higher one, this is level 1A. And uh, it is involved in the pathology of the floor of the mouth and anterior oral cavity, anterior mandibular alveolar bridge, and lower lip. Submandibular level 1B. It is uh, bounded by anterior belly of diagnostic, stylohyoid, posterior belly of diagnostic, and body of mandible. So these are the region of level 1B. It is involved in the pathology of oral cavity, anterior nasal cavity, soft tissue structures of mid face, and submandibular gland. Many of these lymph nodes lie in close proximity to the submandibular gland, and it is removed to ensure that the excentration of all lymph nodes within this triangle. There, is peri there are peripheral lymph nodes which drain the lip, buccal mucosa, nasal cavity, soft tissue of neck, sometimes get involved along with level one groups. Lymph, um, nodal dissections performed for nodal disease 
associated with primary lesions of these sites should be modified to encompass peripheral nodes. The level two nodes, they are the upper jugular nodes, which contain two groups, that is level 2A and 2B. They are located around the upper third of internal jugular vein and adjacent spinal accessory nerve. They extend superiorly the extensions from skull base inferior to the inferior border of hyoid bone and anterior medially there is a style or hyoid muscle posterior laterally, uh, posterior laterally it is a posterior border of sternocleidomastoid. So this is the level two vision. So level two A nodes are located anterior to the vertical plane defined by the spinal accessory nerve. Level two B are located posterior to the vertical plane, vertical plane divided defined by spinal accessory nerve. So this is roughly the spinal accessory nerve, which is dividing the two A and two B. So they are involved in the pathology of oral cavity, nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx, hypopharynx, larynx, and parotid. Level 3 nodes are the middle jugular lymph nodes. They are located around the middle third of the internal jugular vein. They extend superiorly, extend superiorly the carotid bifurcation, inferior aspect of uh, hyoid bone. And inferior it is a junction of homohyoid muscle to the internal jugular vein or the lower border of cricoid arch of package. Medially, it is a lateral border of sternohyoid muscle, laterally the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid. So this is posterior border, and here will be the upper uh, division of uh, common carotid, and it is cricoid much. So level three nodes are involved in oral cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx, hypopharynx, and laryngeal pathology. Level four nodes are the lower jugular group of nerve zones located around the lower one third of internal jugular vein. And they extend superiorly from the junction of homohyoid muscle with IJV or lower border of cricoid cartilage arch. And inferiorly, there is a clavicle. Medially, it, uh, it is bounded by the anterior border of sternohyoid and laterally the, by the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid. So, this is the level four group of lymph nodes. That's the level four group. The so level four are involved in hypopharyngeal thyroid. Uh, cervical, esophageal, and laryngeal pathology. Level 5 are the posterior triangle lymph node groups. They are located along the lower half of the spinal accessory nerve and transverse cervical artery. They extend is superiorly the convergence of sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle, inferiorly the clavicle, medially the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle, and laterally the anterior border of trapezius muscle. So this is sternocleidomastoid, this is a trapezius, and the triangle here contains level 5 nodes, 5A and 5B. So 5A is, is separated from 5B by a horizontal plane. Uh, so level 5A is separated from 5B by a horizontal plane, marking the inferior border of anterior cricoid arch. Level 5A are the spinal accessory nodes, and level 5B are nodes following the transverse cervical vessels and supraclavicular nodes and not virtual nodes. Virtual nodes are located at level 4, level 5 are not virtual nodes. So these are involved in the path, uh, pathology of nasopharynx, oropharynx, cutaneous structures of skull, posterior scalp, and neck. neck. And level six, they are the lymph nodes of the anterior compartment of the neck. They surround the midline visual structures of the neck. They extend superiorly. The extent is superiorly the hyoid bone. Inferiorly is a suprasternal notch. Laterally, the medial border of carotid sheath on each side. So lymph node groups are pretracheal, paratracheal, precricoid, perithyroidal, and nodes along the recurrent pharyngeal nerve. So it is involved in the pathology of thyroid gland glottis subglottis, larynx, apex of piriform sinus, and cervical esophagus. Level 7 nodes. They are the superior mediastinal group of nodes. Extension of paratracheal group 
extending inferiorly below the suprasternal notch along each side of cervical trachea to the level of innominate artery. So the the it extend the superiorly the there is a superior extend the superior edge of mandibulum, inferiorly the inferior border of of arch of uh, iota. Literally, it is a common carotid artery on the left side. Right side, it is a innominate artery. This is, is a level with anterior compartment and somewhere here is the level seven. So coming to the carcinoma trunk. So carcinoma trunk uh, incidence. Oral cancer is sixth most common cancer. In India, tongue cancer is among the top eight common cancers. So carcinoma tongue is the second most common site of oral cancer after lip. So the common age of presentation is elderly patients with uh, in fifth or sixth decade, men uh, with a higher frequency in men when compared to women. So site-wise incidence, the middle one third of lateral border of the tongue is a commonest site um, occurring in about 47% cases and posterior one third uh, occur, uh, lesions occur in 20% of cases. Tip of the tongue lesions occur in 15% of cases and ventral surface and femindum in 9% and dorsum of the tongue in 6.5% and facial lingual involvement in 6% of cases. So etiology of tongue cancer, it is mostly the tobacco smoking and chewing in any form. Smokers have a 1.9 fold risk of cancer in males and three fold risk in, of uh, cancer formation in females. So the risk increases with the number of years of smoking and number of smoke, uh, smoke cigarettes per day. 90% so of the patients with tongue cancer have a history of tobacco use. It takes 20 years for a smoker or a tobacco chewer to abstain from uh, about to clear of the risk of developing cancer. So tobacco chewing increases the risk eight times for buccal cancer. With quid, the risk increases to 10 times. If the quid is kept overnight in the mouth, the risk increases to 30 times. Reverse smoking with a fire inside the mouth is also a very uh, known uh, risk factor for CATA. In a study by Moore, 40% of patients who persisted smoking after the cure of primary oral cancer developed a second cancer when compared to 6% of those who quit smoking. So alcohol consumption alone or combined with uh, smoking is a risk factor for development of CATA. So one, there is 1.7 fold risk of developing cancer in males who drink, who have two drinks per day and three fold risk in heavy drinkers. Patients who smoke two packs per day and drink four units of alcohol have 35 fold increase of increased risk of development of oral carcinoma. So whenever we are advising patients, we have to advise them to quit smoking and alcohol as a preventive step uh, to, uh, to decrease the incidence of oral cancer. And chewing beetle, quid, barn, arica nut, HPV virus infection 16 uh, are uh, some of the other uh, etiological factors for uh, CA tongue. And HPV is detected in about 60 to 90 patient cases of oral cancer. And it is present in 40% of normal oral cavity. And uh, uh, HIV, AIDS, and immunosuppression are also etiological causes for uh, development of oral cancer and along with Epstein Barr virus. Dietary factors which lead to oral cancers are uh, iron deficiency anemia, and uh, which are protective are vitamin A, fresh fruits, and vegetables. Iron deficiency anemia may lead to squamous cell cancer of hypopharynx and oral cavity. Other conditions like poor dental hygiene, ill fitting dentures causing chronic irritation, upper aero uh, diagnostic tract cancers are some of the other etiological factors for, uh, for uh, development of CATA. So, this is an important slide which shows the pre malignant conditions of 
corneal cavity. So the pre-malignant or pre-cancerous lesions include lipoplakia, erythroplakia, and uh, chronic hyperplastic candidiasis, which is these are uh, divided into um, low risk and high risk conditions and intermediate risk and doubtful association. So this um, oral submucosal fibrosis, syphilitic corsitis, hydropinic dysphagia are other big uh, pre-cancerous conditions and uh, doubtful association is associated with the oral lichen planus, discoid lupus, erythematous and dyskeratosis congenita. So describing each leukoplakia is a white page or a black patch or a plaque that cannot be characterized clinically or pathologically as any other disease. So clinically it is present as a white or gray, soft or crusty lesion. It may persist the same since uh, since the occurrence, or it may regress, it may progress, or it may recur after excision. So there are two types of Leukoplakia, which is called nodular leukoplakia, homogeneous leukoplakia. Speckled or nodular leukoplakia is more common, uh, more, more common to turn into malignancy. Pathological changes in leukoplakia include hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis, acanthosis. So the, uh, there is an overall 5% risk of malignant trans uh, transformation of leukoplakia. Over uh, ten, uh, 10 year duration, uh, there is a risk of 2.4%, and over 20 year duration, there is a risk of 4%. For so age less than 50 years, the instance of malignancy is 1% uh, in patients with leukoplakia. Between 70 to 89 years, it is 7.5%. Leukoplakia of the floor of the mouth and ventral surface of the tongue, there is high instance of malignant change due to the pooling of carcinogens in the floor of the mouth. So this is the classical picture, which you are here you can see a white patch in the lateral surface of the tongue. Most cases of leukoplakia will disappear if alcohol and tobacco consumption ceases. One year cessation, leukoplakia will disappear in 60% of cases. Biopsy from suspicious areas, ulceration, induration, and hyperemia uh, is done. Uh, biopsy from suspicious areas is done when there is ulceration, induration, and hyperemia. Surgical excision or CO2 laser can also be used and they have to be regularly followed up at four, uh, four months to, uh, interval. Erythroplakia is a lesion of the oral mucosa that presents as a bright red velvety plaques which cannot be characterized clinically or pathologically as any other recognizable condition. So incidence of malignant transformation is 17 times higher than leukoplakia and it occurs mostly about the age of 60 years, and it must be excised surgically. So this is a red uh, uh, patch you can see. Which is, uh, and chronic hyperplastic uh, candidiasis, it is also a pre-malignant condition. There are dense chalky plaques of keratin deposits, which are more opaque than non-candidial leukoplakia. These are mostly seen in the commissures of the oral cavity, and uh, there is a candidial infection with an immunological defect and there is high incidence of malignant change. Then oral submucosal fibrosis. There are fibrous bands beneath the oral uh, mucosa which uh, progressively contact, contract and ultimately result in restriction of mouth opening and tongue movements. So there is a slow growing squamous cell carcinoma is seen in about one third of the patients. So you can see that uh, if there is a submucosal fibrosis, there are the bands just beneath the mucosa. So it is uh, st uh, strongly associated with chewing ericanet. It is a pre-malignant condition. It can affect any part of the oral mucosa. There are palpable fibrous bands over the oral mucosa and molar area and rima oris. And restriction of mouth opening and presence of Christmas is a common presentation. It will not regress with the cessation of ericanet chewing. The fit is called uh, glossitis. Uh, it, is a, a, it is one of the pre-malignant conditions. Uh, which leads to endarteritis, atrophy of the overlying epithelium, more, uh, and uh, this epithelium becomes more vulnerable to irritants, leading to the development of squamous cell cancer, even in the absence of leukoplakia. And these changes are irreversible. This is one syphilitic glossitis picture. And coming to the pathology. Uh, squamous cell uh, cancer occurs in about 95% of oral malignancies. 
uh, other uh, glands, other uh, sites, as malignant salivary glandations, mucosal melanomas, lymphomas, and sarcomas also occur in oral cavity, also come under oral cavity cancers. And in the earliest recognizable stage, squamous cell cancer, there is a there are presence of firm pearly plates or irregular rough and varicous areas of mucosal thickening. Pathological types of tongue squamous cell cancer include ulcerative, watery, indurated, and fissures types. So ulcerative is the most common and uh, with irregular everted edges and indurated bases. Watery growths usually occur over previous weaker placias. Indurated masses or plaques occur uh, anywhere of the tongue and fissures usually follow the superficial glossitis. Okay, this is one uh, ulceration you can see on the lateral surface of the tongue. Mode of the spread. So, uh, CA tongue usually has a local spread, infiltration and invasion. And anterior two third of the tongue, they spread to the floor of the mouth and causes midline. Sorry. In posterior one, to the, one third of the tongue, they spread to the tonsil, carrying soft palate and epiglottis. So, mandible infiltration. So mandible, which is very close proximity to the tongue. So there is high chance of mandible infiltration. So oral cancers have got both radial and vertical growth. And the cancer spreads along the floor of the mouth and reaches the mucoperiosteum of the mandible. There is a dented or edentulous mandible may be present. Or previously, uh, radiation may be taken, may not be taken. So when it reaches the mandible, uh, the mucoperiosteum is relatively resistant. So once uh, there is no uh, dentition after two destruction, this uh, mucoperiosteum is uh, disrupted. So the, the, when there is dentition, teeth are attached to the alveolus by periodontal lig uh, ligaments. After two extraction, there is a hematoma in alveolar pockets, which epithelize and there is poor resistance to inflation, that is, there is a mucoperiosteal layer is slightly uh, interrupted. And in edentulous uh, mandible, there is bone resorption and reduction in the height of mandible and poor resistance to infiltration. So such cases, there is uh, high chances of tumor infiltration to the mandible. So the cancer spreads along the mucoperiosteum. It destroys the periodontal ligaments and gains access to the alveolus. And then the tumor travels along the root of the tooth and it is the spongy bone of the mandible. And they spread along the spongy neurovascular bundle of the mandible and involves the inferior alveolar canal. So they extend along the perineural, uh, perineural space of alveolar nerve, the mandibular nerve and cavernous sinus. So this is the space, the spongy bone. So when this spongy bone is involved, it will have the nerve involvement and patient has sent, uh, symptoms based on nerve involvement and the bone also uh, gets weakened. So distance spread, that is about local spread, distance spread is through to the lymphatic, or the lymph nodes of the neck. Tumors of the oral cavity and floor of the mouth have high propensity to metastasize to the neck lymph nodes when compared to any other oral cancers. So generally, patients present with a non-healing painless ulcer, excessive salivation because of irritation caused by the ulcer, pain, which is a very late feature, mostly occurs due to the involvement of nerves, and there is a deferred pain because um, of uh, common innovation by glossopharyngeal and trigeminal nerves, and pain on swallowing in the posterior one-third tumors. So this is a classical ulcer. And the little one-third of the tongue, you can, have, you can see there's a lot of uh, excess salivation. And there is restricted movement of the tongue. Patient complains of difficulty in pronouncing certain words. And there is infiltration of the muscles of the floor of the mouth, uh, causing ankyloglossia. That is, a tongue doesn't move properly. And there may be bleeding. There may be a bad odor. And trismus uh, due to involvement of pterygoid muscle. And there may be mandibular involvement because of bone, uh, bone infiltration and alveolar nerve involvement. So how are we going to evaluate? We have to take a history about the personal habits, hygiene, family history, tobacco chewing, smoking, alcoholism, tooth extraction, failure of the socket to heal, unexplained tooth mobility, and difficulty in wearing dentures. 
and history of difficulty in opening the mouth, protrusion of the tongue, difficulty in swallowing, salivation, talking, history of earache. And upon physical examination, we are going to observe for slurring of the speech when the tongue uh, muscles are involved. And oral cavity, we have to look for the uh, for ankyloglossia, that is inability to protrude the tongue or fixation of the tongue because of involvement of uh, muscles of the tongue and ulcers that bleed to touch. We have to look for profuse salivation, which is due to the irritation of the nerve fibers of the taste and results in difficulty, and also as a result of difficulty in swallowing. We have to look for the uh, deviation of the tongue, which involves involvement of hypoglossal nerve. We have to look for uh, induration of the tongue when the tongue inside uh, when the tongue is inside the mouth. And we have to palpate the black uh, back of the tongue. The tumors of the posterior third of the tongue will spread to the tonsil and fillers. We have to examine the cheek, gum, floor of the mouth, trigon areas of uh, uh, the areas and tonsillar areas for the presence of a second primary. And uh, infiltration of the mandible causes pain and swelling of the jaw. So you have to examine for the mandible also. And we have to look for the cervical nodes. And carcinoma tongue is a systemic disease. Therefore, look for metastasis, especially the lung metastasis. And we have to look for the big cancerous lesions. A, a complete head and neck examination and direct laryngoscopy, mental, uh, dental and uh, mandibular evaluation should be done. And OPG, which is a X-ray of the mandible, should be taken. CT scan is indicated when you are suspecting involvement of pterygoid muscles and patients with trismus and lesions which are abutting the mandible. Uh, where um, uh, in cases where we are planning for a marginal mandibulectomy in order to clinically evaluate uh, negative necks and then also patients with large nodes to look for carotid artery involvement. It is also useful to assess assessment of pterygoid muscles. So this is an orthopantogram. You can see the involvement of mandible. There is a, there are loss of tooth on this left side and there is a weakening of uh, um, bone. And this is a fracture line, I think. So MRI uh, is an investigation of choice uh, to assess infiltration and to detect the perineal spread of the tumor. It is useful for the tongue for assessing the extent of cancer. It is also useful for oral and oropharyngeal cancers. Its advantages um, over CT is that image is not degraded by the presence of a metallic dental restoration. So whenever there is a, a metallic uh, denture, so uh, it is uh, picture quality is not degraded in an MRI. So PET CT also evaluates, uh, can also be done, which evaluates the response to chemotherapy in primary and nodal stage uh, sites and uh, with unknown primary and distant nets. So, ultrasound of the neck is useful for uh, uh, ultrasound guided uh, aspiration of the nodes and for surveillance of the patients and also for. Uh, detection of uh, any any other secondary growths after N0 neck uh, management. So X-ray we can do for facial bones and which perhaps of the primary lesion can be done in case of suspicious cases and FNSE of the lymph nodes can be done. So we have to do uh, in direct and uh, laryngoscopy, pharyngoscopy of regoscopy to rule out the presence of second primary and to completely assess the extent of tumor. So TNM staging, it is uh, TX, T0, uh, carcinoma in situ, T1 is tumor less than two centimeters, T2 is tumor two to four centimeters, T3 is tumor more than four centimeters, T4 is erosion of um, cortical bone, extrinsic muscles, maxillary sinus and skin of the face, T4B is invasion of terrified palate, a terrified plate skin uh, of uh, skull base and uh, ICA, that is internal carotid artery. Nodes, again, the N1 nodes are ipsilateral single, uh, less than three centimeters. N2 is ipsilateral node, which is uh, three to six centimeters. N2B is multiple ipsilateral nodes. N2C is bilateral or congenital nodes, less than six centimeters. And N3 nodes are more than six centimeter nodes. Midline nodes are considered as ipsilateral nodes. So metastasis, no distance metastasis and metastasis. So this is a staging. So involvement of 
for nodes is stage three. Uh, N one nodes is stage three. N two nodes or N E T is stage four uh, A, and uh, N three nodes are four B, and uh, metastasis is four C. So treatment depends on the site of the tumor, presence of previous radiation, history, and personal status, stage of the tumor. Early stage, we have to go for surgery. Intermediate stage, surgery plus radiotherapy. Late stage also, we can go for surgery plus radiotherapy. So what is the aim of our surgery? So aim is complete excision with microscopically clear margins, nodal management, reconstruction of tissue loss, restoration of function, and improved quality of health. So the treatment options for early stage T1, T2, N0 disease, surgery plus radiotherapy, you can go for external beam radiotherapy or brachytherapy, T3, uh, N0, T4, N0, and all other node positive diseases other than N3. You can go for uh, surgery plus post-operative uh, radiotherapy, uh, added with or without chemotherapy. T4, B disease, that is the stage 3 disease with N3 and with metastasis in stage 3 and 4. You can go for a palliation radiotherapy plus chemotherapy. So primary tumor treatment T1 and T2, you can go for a single modality surgery or radiation. T3, T4, you have to go for a combined modality chemo radiation or surgery and uh, post-operative. Next treatment N0, N1 nodes, you can go for surgery or radiation. N2, N3 nodes, um, you can go for surgery with post-op chemo radiotherapy. Both sides of the neck are treated when there are midline lesions. So this is already uh, discussed. High risk of local regional uh, recurrence is present with single modality treatment. T1 and 0 when it is superficial, less than 4 mm uh, size of the tumor, and which is well differentiated, you can go for surgical resection or radiotherapy. T1 and 0 more than 3 millimeters, and T2 N0 have high propensity for nodal metastasis. So whenever there are no nodes, but only uh, no palpable nodes, and only the tumor is present, so uh, you have to manage the neck nodes also. So there is high instance of occult metastasis in N0 neck with uh, instance of 15 to 43%. So you have to do the surgery for the primary, and you have to go for neck dissection. Brachytherapy for primary uh, can be done and EBRT for neck can be done or elective neck dissection can also be done. For locally advanced tumor, combined therapies can be done. T1, T2, and N1, N2, that is stage 3 and 4A surgery, uh, which is the wide excision of uh, the primary tumor and neck dissection can be done. Or radiotherapy, which includes EBRT or brachytherapy for primary, followed by EBRT for neck. So surgical salvage for primary or neck is reserved for clinical or radiological residue. So whenever there is a surgery failure, you can go for a radiotherapy, but post-radiotherapy, you cannot go for surgery. So midline nodes, both sides, uh, we have to do for a, go for neck dissection. Adjoint radiotherapy following neck dissection can be given and the node size is large in three centimeters, history of multiple metastatic deposits and node shows extra capsular invasions. So T3, T4A, N2 disease, that is a 4A. If it is in the anterior tongue, if it is resectable, you go for surgery and add it with chemo or T. If it is, uh, or if it is not resectable, you can go for primary chemotherapy and surgical salvage. You can go for, uh, so primary chemotherapy may uh, may, may totally regress the tumor, which is called a complete response. Okay, then uh, T4B N3, that is a stage 4B disease, you better go for a chemo radiation therapy. If the, if after therapy, if the surgery, if it is resected, you can go for a surgery. So stage 4A, 4B, you have to go for local regional uh, therapy plus chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is given by paclitaxel, docetaxel, platinum compounds. And uh, when there is a very large primary tumor or known, you have to go for chemotherapy initially for downstriving. 
So complete response after chemo or radiotherapy occurs only in five to ten percent of cases. Such cases you can go for a follow-up. Post radiotherapy recurrent tumors, second primary is occur in the field of radiation. So such cases you have to go for surgery. So it is called surgical salvage of radiotherapy failure. So radiation safety situations where this is free survival is long can be considered. So criteria for unresectability. So whenever you are having a tumor, so you have to know whether it is resectable or not. So criteria for unresectability include involvement of skull base, extensive skull base involvement, extensive perineural involvement, carotid artery infiltration, encasement of the primary tumor, uh, 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 carotid artery encasement for the primary tumor or lymph node, and extensive soft tissue involvement, extensive cutaneous lymphedema and nodules. So what will you do when the tumor is in the posterior third of the tongue? So posterior tongue tumors, surgical resections may not be feasible sometimes and will be of unacceptable morbidity. So we can we go for a primary chemo radiation. And post radiation residual cancers, we can go for a surgical resection. Plus bulky flaps may be needed to reduce aspiration and to uh, and during liquidation and for reconstruction. And radiotherapy, radiotherapy which uh, uh, radiotherapy can be given in early stages. It has got equal efficacy as surgery when given in early stages. It is either uh, brachytherapy, teleradiotherapy, external beam radiotherapy, combined therapy. Post-operative radiotherapy is preferred over pre-operative radiotherapy. So primary radiotherapy, radiation is given as a primary treatment. Um, so what is the advantage is the radiotherapy um, kills the oxygenated cells or uh, so a radiation in a in a initial tumor. A, a primary radi radiotherapy radiation radiation on a well oxygenated tumor cell. So it is unhampered by post uh, surgery fibrosis. So there is higher response we can expect. And centripetal con uh, contraction, the scope of improving the surgical margin, the, sur the size of the tumor shrinks. RT failures, tumor cells in the center uh, of the field. So when the tumor cells are in the center, the margins of the uh, tumor are, uh, are in become inactive, but the tumor in the center of the field may be active. While post surgery failures, uh, the tumor at the margins of the tumors may be may regrow. So, post surgical radiation must include entire surgical margin, incision, draining sites, and uh, needs larger fields, uh, hence, more morbidity. So, disadvantages are endarthritis, wound healing problems if surgery is being performed later. It can be reduced by vascularized tissue flaps for reconstruction. So whenever it is uh, given preoperative, when is it given preoperative? In case of inoperable cases, for downsizing the tumor and uh, for patients who are unfit for surgery. Postoperative T3, T4 primary tumor, post positive surgical margins, that is after surgery, if the margins are positive, we can go for a radiotherapy. Presence of perineural, perivascular, lymphatic invasions. Um, and presence of microscopic cross residual disease, you can go for a post operative radiotherapy, extra corpus class spread, pathologically positive nodes. So, this is the dose of EBRT 6500 to 7000 range, and brachytherapy you can give larger doses. Iridium, celsium needles can be placed in the tumor, and up to 1000 dads can be delivered. Small area effects of radiotherapy, xerostomia, erythema, thin ulceration, dental fluffing carries posterior radio necrosis on healing problems. So surgery, surgery for the primary tumor includes transoral approach, transmandibular approach, transparential approach. So transoral approach is for small anterior tongue cancers that can be adequately exposed, removed, and reconstructed without any additional incision. Superficial tumors in situ, two centimeter cuff of normal tissue. But if it's to four centimeters, you can do a primary closure. A three zero comic or vicable sutures in one or two layers and for uh, for little tongue defects and two layers for midline tip tip. If defect is large, the tongue is foliar black to close the defect. 
for the effects involving half of the antiretum, an isolabial or a free radial forearm flap may be needed to reconstruct. It affects more than half of the tongue, particular flaps are needed to restore the volume to aid in speech and swallowing. So lip splitting or cheek flap uh, transmandibular approach um, is uh, the lip splitting the cheek incision is combined with the lateral mandibulotomy and it gives an excellent exposure to large uh, anterior tongue and base of the tongues and uh, it is done along with neck dissection. So here uh, total vasectomy can be done and reconstruction using large bulkier flaps to prevent aspiration and preservation of larynx. And frequently after this, prolonged opponent uh, gastrostomy and tube bleeding may be required in some patients. Recurrent aspirations may occur, so total laryngectomy may be indicated in some patients. Then lateral pharyngotomy approach, it is for small tumors at the base of the tongue and uh, it avoids injury to the hypoglossal super, uh, superior laryngeal nerves. Complications of surgery are evaluated on healing problems with their fistula formations, oral nasal, oropharyngeal fistulas, which are very bad in healing, and mandibular necrosis, hemorrhage, carotid blowout problems, and uh, degradation issues and speech related issues may be present. Airway related obstruction may be because of edema, hematoma, seroma formation, nerve injury. So you can deal with them with tracheostomy. Hemorrhage may be because of carotid blowout, which may be an emergency. So it requires a carotid uh, artery ligation and oral and pharyngeal dysfunction um, causes dysphagia aspiration. So you have to go for a nasogastric tube uh, feeding or a gastrostomy feed. Orocutaneous or pharyngeal fistula, pharyngocutaneous fistulas lead to malnutrition. Uh, fistulae um, may uh, occur post malnutrition, radiation, mucosal closure, under tension, infection, foreign body, residual tumor. So, initially, you can go for a wide drainage or wound packing and compressing the thing. If there's a, if the, a fistula is persistent, you can go for a re excavation of the wound and close the fistula with vascular flaps. So mandibular complications include osteotomies, poor wound healing, osteoretal necrosis of the mandible, malocclusion, malunion, and uh, you can do a mandibular fixation. Effects. Little mandibular re uh, resection, uh, you can go for occlusion exercises and segmental resections and flap related complications include flap loss. The treatment of the neck, radical neck resection involves removal of all five lymph nodes five levels with, um, with spinal accessory nerve, internal jugular vein and square, uh, and sternocleidomastoid master and muscle. Modified radical neck dissections include all five levels with preservation of all the three structures. Type 1 uh, uh, mod MRND includes uh, preservation of spinal accessory nerve. Type 2 includes spinal accessory plus IGV preservation. Type 3 includes preservation of spinal accessory nerve, internal jugular vein, and sternocleidomastoid master muscle. All three structures are preserved. So any zero neck, when there are no nodes palpable, we can go for a super higher dissection, which includes the levels one, two, three. Uh, if, the, if the nodes uh, have any tumor invasion, you can go for a radiotherapy. Extended omaha higher neck dissection includes level four. So pathologically positive nodes, you can go for a radical neck or path, um, modified radical neck dissection. So these are the chemotherapy regimens, which includes this pattern for six to seven weeks, or the cisplatin added with paclitaxel, cisplatin added with 5 few and uh, given for uh, four weeks, and cisplatin alone with uh, concurrent radiotherapy. So palliative care includes chemo radiotherapy, palliation is for pain, fungating masses to relieve airway obstruction in case of uh, very late stage disease advanced stage disease where uh, surgery cannot be done. Tracheostomy for strider feeding tubes like PEG and nasogastric tube gastrostomy and jejunostomy tubes for feeding and external carotid artery like patient in order to prevent um, life-threatening tumor bleeding. So follow-up we can do for uh, first year follow-up is for every one to three months, second year follow-up every two to four months, third year follow-up for three to six months, fourth then fifth year every six months and uh, after this year, every one year. So poor prognosis is, occurs when the tumor thickness is more than uh, 4 mm and poorly differentiated tumor with a high grade and perineural vascular and lymphatic invasion, DNA polyploid status such as aneuploidy and varicose cancer. So survival for stage one disease is 70%. And for stage two is 40%. So stage three is uh, 
25% for stage 4 is less than 20%. So overall survival is around 50%. Thank you.